Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this quarterly edition of the Water Quality Advisory Workgroup meeting. It's put on by the TCEQ Water Quality Division. My name is Greg Easley. I manage the Water Quality Assessment section uh, in the Water Quality Division, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon. And before we get into things, just wanted to mention a, a couple of items. First, for those of you uh, who are watching and haven't done so already, if you would please do us the favor of um, verifying your attendance uh, with, with this meeting, and you can do so by going to the, the Q&A um, chat box, uh, which is one of the little text balloons that has the question mark uh, in them. Uh, you click on that and there should be a link there that you can use to, uh, to confirm your attendance with us. We'd appreciate that. Also, uh, as we go through different uh, presenters, we're going to uh, hold off on answering any questions until we get to the end of, of uh, the final presenter. Uh, you're certainly welcome to type in your questions as they come in, as they come to you in the in the Q and A um, box, uh, you know, there on your screen. But um, again, we'll wait, hold off until answering those questions until uh, we get near the end of the meeting. Um, so with that, uh, before we jump into the topics, I wanted to uh, have each of our presenters introduce themselves real quick. And uh, I guess, Lori, let's start with you, please. Hello, I'm Lori Fleet. I'm with the Water Quality Division. Um, I'm acting section manager at this time. Um, hopefully they'll have the section manager position filled soon. But in the interim, I've been acting section manager now for quite some time. <laughs> um, I'll hand it over to Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Linder. I'm the team leader of the Industrial Wastewater Permits Team. Sorry, and I'll go to uh, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Villalba. I'm the team leader for the Stormwater Team uh, in the Water Quality Division. Hi, my name is Michaela Coleman. I'm a permit writer with the Stormwater team in the Water Quality Division. All right, thank you everyone. Appreciate that. So uh, for today, as usual, we have several different types of updates, some program updates, permit updates, and, uh, and one rule update. So we'll start off uh, as indicated on the uh, the agenda for today with program updates and I will turn it over to Lori Fleet. All right, so my topic today is permit renewal um, deadline. So in all of our permits, uh, individual permits, I'm going to clarify that in all of our individual permits, um, there's a requirement that you submit your renewal application 180 days before the expiration date. Um, we have not historically enforced that requirement, but um, I'm here to remind you, I think I said this at the last uh, Water Quality Advisory Workgroup meeting, um, but I'm here to remind you that we are now enforcing that requirement. And um, if you, we will accept applications late, meaning it, you know, less than 180 days, but uh, it would potentially be a violation of your permit and you may you may receive an NOV for that. But um, just want to make sure that everybody is aware. Um, I don't want anybody getting any violation. Um, so be sure that you start preparing your renewal application um, well in advance. Uh, I think uh, about a year ahead of the expiration date, you will get a postcard or a letter um, from us reminding you about your application renewal date. And so I would encourage you whenever you get that notification in the mail, you start you know, putting together the application. Um, our individual permit applications are rather lengthy, so it's not something that you can wait till the last minute to do. Um, go ahead about a year before your permit expires and get started uh, developing those application forms gathering all the information that you're going to need to submit as attachments with it um, so that you can get it submitted 
180 days before it expires. Um, so with that, um, one last little tidbit, just to make sure we're clear, this applies to individual permits only. It does not apply to general permits. So if you are authorized under a general permit, um, typically you apply for coverage after we, CCQ, renew that permit. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Mike to give us an update on the House Bill 2771. All right, thank you, Lori. And just uh, for any of you who missed the last meeting, which I think was uh, around about January 21st, that was just after the TCQ had received delegation from the EPA to implement the wastewater permitting uh, program for oil and gas facilities. And so just a reminder, hopefully for most and, and maybe news to some of the, those who weren't in the last meeting that uh, we did the TCQ, that is, did get delegation from the EPA to administer the wastewater permitting program. Um, and having said that, um, disposal of oil and gas facility wastewater by land application, uh, such as irrigation or evaporation, that did stay with the Railroad Commission. So everything other than that, uh, we are now doing instead of EPA and the Railroad Commission. Um, and so if you, you know, currently have an EPA or Railroad Commission permit, um, those are still good um, as long as they're, um, you know, not expired. Um, they're still good while we get our program up and running and kind of piggybacking a little bit on what Lori just said. You know, if you have a Railroad Commission permit and an EPA permit, um, the idea would be that you would get the application into us um, six months ahead of time. I know that's not always going to be possible. Um, you know, we just got the program and, and so that requirement may have caught some of you a little off guard and of course we'll, we'll understand. Um, but to the extent that you're able, i.e. that your permit does not expire for six months or more from, from now, um, if you could please get your application in as soon as possible. And you know it would be if if you have a railroad commission permit and an EPA permit, you'd want to get your permit application to us, ideally six months ahead of time of the soonest expiration date of those two permits. It's possible that uh, some folks may only have um, a a railroad commission permit because there are some waters that are waters in the state that aren't waters of the U.S. So it's possible that you may have only required a railroad commission permit. So if you only have one permit, then to state the obvious, you'd want to get ideally your application into us six months ahead of the expiration date of that permit. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Also, you know, an individual permit is an option, although we, we do foresee most of y'all being able to be covered under the general permits that we are developing. Um, but mainly for west of the 98th meridian, um, you know, we, we suspect that some people will be getting an individual permit. And so for those folks, um, we have created a separate administrative report as part of our application um, because of the whole aspect that, you know, you have to notify sometimes landowners that are actually on the facility's property because of just kind of the nature of the beast of oil and gas. Uh, and so we didn't want to confuse our our normal applicants who um, would only ever have to notify people, you know, adjacent to their facility and not necessarily people, um, you know, would land on their facility. And so um, there is a separate, like I say, administrative report part of the industrial wastewater application for oil and gas facilities for an individual permit. And then the technical report part of the industrial application for oil and gas facilities is the same as for all other types of industrial facilities. There is a worksheet added on to the end of the industrial report part of the industrial wastewater application that is specifically tailored to oil and gas facilities. Um, and then just speaking of oil and gas facilities for, for gas plants, they would use the, um, the normal admin report 
um, for industrial facilities, not the special one we created for oil and gas uh, development and exploration facilities. Um, so for gas plants, it's just the same exact application as all other industrial facilities, both the administrative report and the technical report. Um, all righty, and I will, um, I'll put a link in, let me see if I can do that right now. Um, that I just pasted in the link um, um, to the page with those applications. Um, so moving on to kind of what we're working on. Um, my former boss, Chris Lindendahl, he was section manager over wastewater permitting for, for many years, and he was my boss for about seven years. Um, and he has come back to work with us and he, he works for me now. Um, I don't work for him anymore. And, um, but it's a, it's an honor and, and a privilege to work with him. And he, he's, he's drafting the two, the, um, the two general permits that we're developing. One, uh, he's, he's, he's completed the initial draft and that is a general permit for stripper wells, coastal facilities and facilities in the territorial seas, which is, defined as um, from uh, facilities that are up to three miles from shore. So that draft general permit is in management review, and he's also um, drafting a state of Texas general permit that will cover oil and gas facilities <clears throat> in the outer continental shelf, which is defined of, as between three miles and 10.2 miles. Um, so, oil and gas facilities in that range, in that mileage between three and 10.2 miles, ultimately they'll have an EPA permit and a state of Texas permit. And then beyond 10.2 miles, uh, those facilities will just have a federal permit because the state of Texas doesn't have jurisdiction beyond 10.2 miles. Um, so, and Chris is, he's working on the draft of that general permit and it's quite complex. Um, I don't know if you've ever taken a look at subchapter A of 40 CFR part 435, but it is just a maze of equations. So um, in any event, um, just kind of a little bit of a logistical update, both the Railroad Commission and the EPA have delivered their physical files to the TCQ and the TCQ central records staff is working on, you know, matching those up to, because of course with the TCQ, you know, the two permits are just going to become one. So we need to make sure that we're matching up the correct permits together. So um, <clears throat> we did have a meeting with EPA on March 30th to just kind of, uh, you know, work on the transition. Uh, we, you know, introduced each other as far as who's, who are the oil and gas staff from each of the agencies. And the TCQ will be taking over all of the permits that were with EPA and still in the middle of processing. So if you had an application that was pending with the EPA, uh, we will be writing that. Um, <clears throat> and on that note, you know, any permittee who had an application pending with the, AP, the EPA, we will be asking you to fill out and submit a TCQ application. And you know, my apologies. I know that I'm sure it doesn't sound like a lot of fun to many of you, um, but on the bright side, I would say that, um, you know, it, sh it shouldn't, it's not going to be just like starting over. It should be a little bit just kind of six of one, half dozen of the other, because most of the information, you know, that you were required to put in your application for EPA or Railroad Commission, we're going to be requiring the vast majority of that same information. It's just that there are state requirements that are part of our application that were not necessarily in the EPA application. We want to make sure that we have them covered. An example that would be the requirement for there to be bilingual notice. So that's not in the federal requirements. So and there are other requirements like that are, that are just state requirements that we have to make sure we have covered. So um, and we're here to help in filling out the application. You have any questions? Um, we're happy to help and we're, we're open to your to your giving us a call. Um, and so what else here? Um, yeah, so permittees who had individual permits under EPA for hydrostatic test discharges, we anticipate that you should be able to get coverage under the TCQ's general permit 
for hydrostatic test discharges, which was already amended to include oil and gas uh, facility discharges for hydrostatic test water. So that's available now. CXG 6700,000, I believe, is the number. And um, like I say, we fully anticipate that any of y'all who had a individual permit under EPA should be able to get coverage under that. You can apply for that now. You apply through STEERS, S-T-E-E-R-S, which is our online um, reporting system. And you can also cancel your EPA permit uh, using the TCQ cancellation forms um, because once you get coverage under our general permit, you're no longer going to be in need of the EPA's individual permit. Um, so that about covers that. And let me see. Oh, yeah. And then as far as any reports that are due to the EPA or the Railroad Commission as part of your current Railroad Commission or EPA permit, um, you will still need to submit those, but you'll be sum submitting them to us, to the compliance monitoring um, part of this agency. And uh, their number is 512-239-1716. And so, yeah, and as far as any discrepancies or differences as to when you have to report, that's when, you know, calling the two, the 512-239-1716 will come in handy because there shouldn't be a need for you to submit the same report at different dates and you should be able to get with them and work that out um, and to where you only have to submit, you know, at one date. Um, okay, that's about all I have and I'll be happy, look forward to any questions you may have at the end of our session. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Um, my apologies, I should have done that. So, okay, it goes to Rebecca, okay. Um, good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Rebecca and I'm going to follow on what uh, Mike um, just discussed, uh, House Bill 2771 implementation. And um, it includes stormwater. I know Mike only talked about wastewater. So, you know, I'm here to let you know that it also includes stormwater. And it was something that um, initially was not discussed, but at the end it includes uh, stormwater. So we received um, state and federal authority from um, EPA regarding uh, the discharges from oil and gas for stormwater discharges, sorry, from oil and, oil and gas. So as of January 15 of uh, this year, we have that authorization. So we started working on what do we need to do with the stormwater program. So I'm not going to give you a lot of detail here because we'll expand a little bit in my uh, next topics that I have. But basically, um, as Mike said, it also applies for the construction general permit that we have, as well as the multi-sector general permit. Right now, EPA does have a permit that belongs to Texas. So their national permit has a little piece that belongs to Texas. So for the construction general permit, it is TX, TXR 10 FSU Frank 000. So if you have a construction general permit with EPA, um, that's the permit under Texas that it, they issue authorizations for us, as well as the MSGP is TXR 05 FS and Frank 000. So right now, those two permits are still um, active with EPA. So you, um, if you have an authorization with EPA under the construction general permit or the MSGP, you will continue to keep your authorization with EPA until we issue a permit that replaces that permit. So for now you continue um, having coverage with EPA. If you are a new entity that's coming in, let's say tomorrow, the next day, then you will apply under our Texas permit that EPA has issued. So you do not need to apply with us because our permits right now do not have the language that authorizes you to apply to us. So you need to continue to submit your application uh, under our permit that EPA has. So I don't know if that's a little, confusing, but that's how um, things are going to keep working for now. So then I will continue and, and talk to you more about how those two permits in Texas, the construction general permit and the multi-sector general permit, um, are going to be amended or revised to include this new delegation of non-exempt uh, stormwater discharges from oil and gas activities. So then that ends that and I'll move on to the construction general permit topic. So the general permit topics, 
The first one is, of course, the construction general permit. So just as I said right now, because of the oil and gas delegation, we started an amendment to this general permit. So the current permit that is in existence expires on March 8th of 2023. We are already going to start the permitting process later on this year to renew that permit. But in the meantime, EPA's general permit expires February 16th of 2022, which is next year. So we have to start an amendment. So last month we started an amendment to the construction general permit to address this new delegation for oil and gas uh, discharges. Uh, for stormwater discharges from oil and gas activities. So please know that if you have an existing authorization, this amendment to the general permit is not going to impact you. So if you currently have an authorization with us under our 2018 construction general permit, you continue to, to keep that. You don't have to apply again when we issue the amendment. So that's something that we want to make sure if you are in doubt, please give us a call and we'll explain things. But um, the amendment is going to only be affecting those entities that are currently um, permitted by EPA and those new entities that are coming in you know, after our permit gets issued that need to apply to us because EPA will no longer have that Texas permit piece under their general permit. So you know, our goal is to get this permit issued, this amendment to the construction general permit issued prior to February of 2022 so that you have time to apply to our permit, specifically in Texas, our TPDS permit, so that you don't have a lapse in permit coverage. So right now, like I said, you know, continue your existing uh, energy, existing construction general permit authorization with Texas, continue that as well as with EPA's permit. So, um, in uh, the federal regulations, there's an exemption, there's something called stormwater that's exempt and stormwater that's non-exempt. So for the exempt uh, or non-exempt stormwater, that is what we are now going to be covering in our general permits. So the amendment is very much focused on addressing this new delegation for stormwater discharges. So we have changed um, the language where we said you cannot apply, now you can apply. And we have um, also with this permit amendment, like I said, uh, get rid of EPA's uh, permit. We're going to replace that. And so make sure that, you know, you stay um, informed, you know, through this updates as well as our web pages. We're going to update them to keep you informed of where we are with this permit. But for now, um, the permit has been updated. We conducted um, management briefings already. And the permit went to EPA for the review on April 15th. So just last week, we sent it to EPA and they are already conducting their, their review of the permit. They typically have 90 days to review a general permit. We have asked kindly that maybe they can do that a little bit quicker, but they officially have 90 days to, to review the permit. Once we get their, um, their comments, hopefully we don't get an objection, hopefully we get an approval, then we'll keep moving along to propose this permit and publish it for you all to review it uh, and continue the process. Like I said, we're trying to go fast as fast as we can to get this permit issued prior to February of next year. Okay, so that's pretty much on the construction general permit amendment. And again, if you're currently permitted under our 2018 permit, this amendment is not going to affect you. But if you are, right now regulated under EPA's permit, then once we issue the amendment, you have to uh, apply with us. And if you're a new facility coming in right now in the interim period, you will have to go and submit your application to EPA. Um, after we issue our amendment, then you come to us and you no longer need to be regulated by EPA. So we'll be moving along to um, the multi-sector general permit. So the multi-sector general permit we are in the renewal period. We have been updating you uh, for a couple of years now because we pretty much start two years in advance. This permit expires August of this year and we started the renewal process in 2019. We have already published in the Texas Register the, the draft permit and fact sheet and uh, the common period ended and we had a public meeting as well uh, this year in January. So we received um, 
many comments in the comment period and they're January 14 and approximately, sorry, approximately 22 entities sent us comments. So we're currently finalizing our response to comments document that um, has already been drafted. It's gone through um, some internal review, legal review, and we're going to start next month moving forward with the management briefings on the final uh, permit, the final fact sheet, and the final response to comments as we've drafted it. We will begin their uh, management briefings to get permission to move forward with the adoption process. So the adoption phase will include us going to the commissioner's agenda sometime in July. Um, right now we have tentatively scheduled for July 14 to go to commissioner's agenda because the permit expires on August 14. Um, that is, you know, maybe subject to change, but uh, that's what we're tentatively um, attempting to go for. About two weeks prior to the agenda date, you will have the ability to see or the opportunity to see the the permit and the fact sheet and the response to comments that we have presented um, for commissioner's agenda. So right now, um, we want to make sure that you understand to please not renew your application right now. I know it's sort of counterintuitive to an individual permit, as Mike just said, for an individual permit. And as Lori said, you need to apply prior to your permit expiring. For a general permit, it's different. For a general permit, you do not apply until that general permit has renewed, been issued. Then you're going to have 90 days from the issuance date to submit your application for renewal. Right now, even when you go to e-permits, you don't have a renewal application available. So because you don't have that, do not go in and say, okay, I'm going to hit a new application because that's going to give you a new authorization number which is not what you want. And then we have to go through the process to have you terminate, terminate that and refund you. And it just creates a lot of unnecessary work from both ends. So please do not renew your application right now because you don't even have that option available in your permit. Wait until the permit gets issued. We are going to issue, I mean, we're, we're going to issue the permit and right after that, like the very next day, we're going to send the postcard. So we're going to mail a postcard to everybody that has an existing authorization giving you the deadline of when you need to apply for renewal. Make sure that you understand that you no longer can submit an application via paper. You have to apply uh, via STEERS and e-permit. You can submit a paper application only if you qualify to obtain approval for a waiver from electronic reporting. And then once the permit is issued in August 14, we will turn around and start working on the amendment to the MSGP to address oil and gas. We were already too far into the process of the renewal process when we received uh, oil and gas delegation that it was too late for us to amend the MSGP to address that. So we're waiting until the permit gets issued, then we're going to open it and amend it to address the oil and gas delegation. So right now in the issued permit that you will see in August, you will not see us addressing oil and gas yet. So other than that, um, I think that's all we have regarding the MSGP. And as Mike said, we'll be taking questions at the end, uh, both of the construction, the multi-sector general permit, and any stormwater questions that you have regarding oil and gas. Um, delegation. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, that's a lot of information on oil and gas, stormwater, and just stormwater in general. Um, so I will, I'll try to keep mine a little bit brief. Um, so my first topic is the Aquaculture General Permit, which is TXG 130000 on March 31st. The Commission reissued that general permit. It authorizes the discharge of wastewater from aquaculture facilities and other activities related to aquaculture into or adjacent to water in the state. And as Rebecca mentioned, now that we've issued that general permit, facilities that are currently authorized under that general permit are required to submit a notice of intent form by July 17th to continue their authorization. So again, this is a general permit. So you submit your application after we renew the permit. 
So existing facilities need to apply for coverage by July 17th to continue their authorization. If you fail to submit that notice of intent form by the deadline, your authorization will expire. Um, we have the issued permit, the fact sheet, and the notice of intent form on our available general permits page. I will post that web address in the chat. Give me just a second to do that. Uh, I'll get that posted shortly. It's, it's twirling. I got the circle of death going on. <laughs> um, and moving on to our next, my next topic is the TXG 110000, which is the concrete batch general permit. We are in the process of renewing and amending that general permit, which authorizes discharges of facility wastewater and stormwater associated with industrial activities into or adjacent to water in the state from ready mix concrete plants, concrete production plants, and their associated facilities. These are covered under standard industrial classification codes 3271, 3272, and 3273. The renewal with amendment will replace the current permit, which expires November 7th of this year. And I'm going to say it again, we're going to keep saying it. <laughs> You do not submit your application to renew until after we, TCEQ, have reissued that permit. So it'll be after November 7th that you would submit your renewal. Um, the current um, status of that renewal with amendments, um, we did go to EPA, um, submitted the draft permit to EPA, and got a no objection letter. So we will be moving that to uh, public notice. repeat of what I just said. These two um, general permits are at, at the same stage. They're kind of going through the process in tandem. Um, so this topic is to discuss the pesticide general permit, which is TXG 870000. Uh, we are renewing and amending the pesticide general permit, which authorizes application of pesticides into, over, or near waters of the United States for the control of mosquitoes or other insect pests, vegetation and algae pests, animal pests, area-wide pests, and forest canopy pests. That draft permit will replace the current permit, which expires on November 2nd of this year. Again, I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. You do not submit a renewal until after we have reissued this general permit, which will be after November 2nd. Um, Again, we went to EPA, we submitted our draft permit to EPA, and they um, submitted to us a, a no objection letter, so no changes were made in response to EPA. And we will be going to public notice uh, in June on this permit as well. Again, it will be published in the Texas Register in at least one statewide newspaper in June. So with that, um, those are my updates. And I believe on our agenda, we next have well, I'm toggling Michaela to give a rule update. Thank you, Lori. OK, so I'm here to give you an update on the sand mining rule petitions that um, you've been getting updates on through the water quality advisory work group for um, a little while now, but just in case we have any new folks with us who are hearing about this for the first time. I will start um, at the beginning. So this rulemaking is a result of petitions received from the Texas Aggregates and Concrete Association and the Lake Houston Area Grassroots Flood Prevention Initiative, which were submitted to TCQ in June of last year. Both of these organizations recommended that TCQ adopt a new rule to establish best management practices or BMPs for commercial sand mining and other lawful purposes within the San Jacinto River watershed. Uh, so the rulemaking will define specific areas within the watershed 
uh, that are going to be regulated and it's it would add a new chapter to the 30 Texas Administrative Code Chapter 311 or the Watershed Protection Rules. In August of last year, the Commission approved the two petitions for TCQ to initiate rulemaking with stakeholder involvement. We held a stakeholder meeting in November of last year to present to stakeholders a draft rule and a few best management practices. And then we received comments from stakeholders um, on December 11th of 2020. We received comments from 14 stakeholders. TCQ reviewed all those comments and drafted the rule. And then of course that rule has to go through different internal reviews. So there's an internal rule team who looked at it and we wrapped up management briefings for the proposal phase of the rulemaking process last week. And so the rule is moving on to the next stage to prepare for the commissioner's agenda. And that draft rule is scheduled to go to commissioner's agenda on June 9th of this year. And that's to request approval for us to publish notice of the draft rule in the Texas Register. And the public will have their first opportunity to view that proposed rule as part of the agenda filings, which are going to be made available at least eight days before the agenda, but typically they're posted two weeks before, so you can be looking out for that. And once published, the rule, or the, once published, the proposed rule will be up for a 30-day comment period, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up the comment period with a public hearing in July of 2021. And then there's plans for us to move that rule to the commissioner's agenda for adoption in November of 2021. So as I mentioned, the rule, the petitions proposed that the rule would require TCQ to develop a guidance document of best management practices. So in conjunction with the rule process, we're also preparing the accompanying guidance document of best management practices that's going to be required by that proposed rule uh, to be implemented by these sand mining facilities. And so that document is going to include BMPs for structural controls, vegetative controls, and controls used during the pre-mining, mining, and post-mining stages. Many of these BMPs we already presented to stakeholders in our November meeting, uh, but we do plan to initiate additional stakeholder involvement for this guidance document following the proposal agenda, so in June of this year. Um, and then stakeholders will have another 30 days to provide us comments on that draft BMP's guidance document and we anticipate publishing a final guidance document concurrently with the effective date of this rulemaking, so in November of this year. Um, for additional information about you know, the, the rulemaking petitions and the rulemaking process, as well as the best management guidance document, you can visit our sand mining stakeholder uh, rule page, web page. Um, I'll put that in the chat as well, so we have it. Um, and that wraps it up for me. All right, thank you, Michaela, and everyone else who provided your updates. Appreciate that. Uh, so now we will move into the questions and answers uh, portion of the meeting. And um, again, for those who may not have heard at the beginning of the meeting, you're welcome to type in your questions in the Q&A section of your screen and submit those to us and we'll uh, we'll get to them in the order that we receive them. So uh, our first question is actually for Rebecca and it says, uh, Rebecca, can you provide us with an update on the status of the SWMP review process for TPDES general permit number TXR 040000? Do you have an estimated time frame of when all of the SWMP reviews will be completed? Thank you. Yeah, I thought you were going to ask for a very specific uh, permit when you start going TXR. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I have to go find out. But basically, we have uh, reviewed about a little less than 200 applications are technically complete, and we're moving forward to the process for the public notice and to um, 
do that. So right now we are, I guess, halfway through the process almost. Um, not exactly, but pretty much. So we think it might still be another year before we get them all issued, but we are working as you know quickly as we can, of course, under the pandemic. It did raise a lot of different um, obstacles that you know we were not all expecting, both from our side as well as the MS4 side. But we are moving now towards the next stage for uh, the public notice, as well as coordinations with EPA to make sure that any comments, uh, concerns that they have on what we are technically approving um, are adequate for us to keep moving to the next stage. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, next question, uh, I think I'm gonna give this one to you, Mike, and feel free to defer if you think someone else would better answer it. But uh, so the question is, has a draft general permit for produced water discharges inland uh, or offshore, I'm sorry, onshore already been released? Also, where the, will there be different general permits for the half of the state west of the 98th meridian compared to the eastern half? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, the answer to the first question, which is has a draft has a draft general permit for produced water discharges inland slash onshore already been released um, is no. Um, we it has not been released yet. Um, like I mentioned in my presentation, I know it went by pretty fast, but basically the uh, you know we're developing two general permits and the one it looks like you're referring to, which would be the general permit that we're developing for um, stripper wells and coastal facilities and territorial seas. Um, that has been drafted, but it's in management review now. So no, it has not been uh, released, um, but it certainly will be as part of the process. Um, and we uh, we hope that'll be, you know, at the latest sometime in, in uh, you know, this summer. Um, but uh, in any event, um, the next question, asking if there will be different general permits for the half of the state west of the 98th meridian compared to the eastern half. Um, no, there, there will not be different general permits. Um, what you may be kind of thinking of in asking this question is the fact that um, if you're west of the 98th meridian, you are eligible for an individual permit uh, and you're eligible to uh, discharge produced water. Um, as long as it has a beneficial use for agriculture um, or wildlife. Um, and so that's that's where that distinction comes in, I guess is the way I would uh, you know term it. Um, is the 98th meridian comes into play for uh, the for produced water being able to be allowed to be discharged. and that's only in the case of if you're west of the 98th meridian, you're getting an individual permit and the produced water that you discharge is has a beneficial use for agriculture or wildlife. Um, and so I guess also just to kind of really close the loop back to your first question, when you asked has a draft general permit for produced water discharges uh, already been released, um, it has not and produced water is actually you know, is prohibited from being discharged uh, inland or onshore unless you're west of the 98th meridian. But there will be no general permit that will allow the discharge of produced water on land, um, and that's by federal regulation. So I think I think I've covered. And feel feel free to ask a follow up question if I didn't uh, answer your question. All right, thank you, Mike. Our next question is for Rebecca. It says, uh, when EMSGP is amended to include oil and gas, how will that affect permittees who have the renewed slash new MSGP in 2021? That's a good question. Let me process it in my head. Um, Denise, you asked me a very good question. So um, when the we're going to renew the 2021 MSGP, then we're going to go ahead and amend it. So what happens is with the 2021 MSGP, we're going to issue in August. 
because we don't have oil and gas in there uh, for the non-exempt stormwater, then an entity cannot apply and renew under that general permit. EP, uh, they need to keep EPA's uh, permit that they have for us, or they need to keep applying under you know that permit that EPA has. After we amend the MSGP and we issue the amended permit, then those industries that were already regulated under the MSGP, they're existing and are not affected by the oil and gas, they will keep their authorization. They don't have to apply anymore. The amendment's going to only be for those oil and gas entities, allowing them to go ahead and apply to us instead of uh, applying to the permit that EPA has for us. So I hope that that answers that question, but basically entities that renew with the 2021 are going to continue with that permit because we're not going to change the expiration permit just like we're uh, expiration date, just like we're not doing that with the construction zone permit, we're keeping the expiration date, then they continue just doing what they need to do. It's only going to affect those entities that need to apply now directly to us because they have um, oil and gas activities or stormwater from oil and gas activities that are not regulated by, by our TPDS permits. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think we could probably just keep the camera on you. Um, but either way, uh, this next question is going to be for you as well. So when should we expect the MSGP oil and gas amendment to be effective? And will this affect all oil and gas sites or is there an, an exemption possible? So the oil and gas um, amendment will not be affected, effective until later on. Like I said, we're going to issue the renewal for the MSGP that we're working on right now. That renewal will finish um, August of this year, and we'll probably rest a couple of weeks, and then we'll go ahead and start the, the amendment process to the MSGP because we don't want to get people confused and have a permit out there while we're in the 90-day renewal period. But the permit is going to go through the process that's also going to be a fast-track process to get it issued, but I cannot tell you at this time we're going to have it done by September of you know whatever year. So it would be within a year, but it's not going to be um, right away. Oh, and then the, there's another question. Will this affect our oil and gas sites or is there an exemption possible? So there are, like I said, there is the Clean Water Act exemption. And so that exemption will continue. We're only going to be adding applicability to our general permit for those stormwater discharges that are non-exempt. So we will clarify that in the permits. It is very clear, at least to us, it's very clear. So when you review it, if it's not clear, please make sure that you comment and let us know. But just as we're doing with the construction general permit, the MSGP will explain who this permit now is going to bring in and what's excluded and what's exempted and what's not exempted. All right, Rebecca, thanks. Stay right there. There's another one for you, uh, or number several, several ones. So uh, does the amended construction general permit require filing the SWPPPs with TCQ or posting them on the internet? What is TCQ's policy with respect to public information requests seeking a SWPPP? And is that policy documented anywhere? Okay, so three questions and I'll give an answer. I don't know, I'm not just kidding. No, so the first uh, part of the question is, does the amended TGP require filing the suits with TCQ or posting them on the internet? No, that is something that is unique to EPA. EPA requires the SWIP to be submitted as when you submit the permit application through their uh, e-permit system. We don't require that. So our permits are going to continue to require that you develop, implement, and you keep your SWIP um, on site. You maintain it. That's going to continue, but you don't need to submit it to us. Um, so if you want to keep it and post it on the internet, that's up to you, but we're not going to be requiring that from, you know, as part of the permit requirement. The policy regarding res in respect to public information requests seeking a SWIP, if we, if we as an agency receive an open records request from an entity 
you know, wanting to get the SWIP for an MSGP uh, or CGP entity then or permittee, unless we have that SWIP with us because maybe it was submitted, sometimes entities submit the SWIP to us even though they're not required, so they're part of the record. Uh, or if we did an investigation, if our investigators went out there and did an investigation as part of that investigation, they obtained a copy of the SWIP, then, we, then it becomes part of our TCQ record and it becomes a public document. So at that time, if we do have a request for an open record uh, for a SWIP for an entity. If we have it, then we have to provide it to the requester. However, if we don't have that SWIP, a copy of that SWIP with us, then we would, depending on who's asking, we might, you know, say, okay, you, you know, we don't have it. You need to ask the entity for it. Um, we don't have a. I'm sure there's a policy in writing, but that's just how we handle open records requests. So, I'm sure there, you know, Chris, I don't know, if you can answer, but I think as the division, we have a process. As an agency, we have a process on how we handle open records requests because that is something that's very important. We don't want to release information that we shouldn't, but at the same time, if we don't have a SWIP, then it's not a public document and we cannot release that because we don't have it. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, our next question is for Michaela. Will the guidance document be, I'm sorry, will the guidance document be available eight days prior to the June 9th commissioner's agenda? Thank you, Greg. Um, so the short answer is no. The, the commissioner's agenda documents are going to be specifically for the rule itself. So it'll be the proposed rule and the preamble and, and those documents. The guidance document is being developed separately from the rule. So we'll be sharing that as part of the stakeholder process separately. Um, so keep an eye on our web pages for updates. And then, you know, at the very latest, it'll be available during the public meeting or the stakeholder meeting, excuse me, where we're going to discuss the draft BMPs document in June. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, I believe Rebecca, you're, you're up again uh, with this next question. Will oil and gas production facilities now require, be required to prepare a SWPPP or SWIP for each location? I, I think uh, the anonymous, you know, person. If you can send an email to to myself um, or to swgp at tcq texas gov, we can address that because I think we need to understand more exactly what you mean by that. But we're not going to change how we require a SWIP to be prepared, or you know, if you meet the requirements of the construction general permit and you need to um, prepare a SWIP, then you need to. So we might need to know a little bit more about what you mean for each location, because if everybody that has an, auth an authorization for that site, you need a SWIP for that site. Depending of, on um, like, this is more for like common plan of development, for larger common plan of development, sometimes there is a way to share a SWIP. So I don't want to give an answer that may not address clearly the issue here. So. If you please uh, send us an email, then we will address it properly. I think Lori has something to add to that as well. Go ahead, Lori. Uh, you're you're muted, Lori. Oh, I was going to take the next question. Um, the question is: Will the TCQ amendment to the construction general permit for oil and gas activities be provided? The public review and comment. The answer is yes. Anytime we um, develop a new general permit, amend or renew an existing general permit, we go through a public notice process and um, the amendment for the construction general permit to expand the ap applicability to include oil and gas facilities will go through a public notice process. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, um, the, the draft is currently with EPA for review. We We've asked for an expedited review from them, but um, they have 90 days. Uh, we're hopeful that, that if, if they're able to get our review 
get the review done um, sooner. We're hopeful that we can go to public notice with this general permit over the summer. It'll likely be later in the summer, maybe July or August. Uh, again, it, it really depends on how quickly EPA can, can complete their review. But it, to answer the question, yes, it will go out for public review and comment. Great, thank you, Lori. Um, Mike, I think I'm going to give you this next question, uh, but you can certainly uh, pass it on if you need to. But uh, it asks, are you currently processing any new applications for oil and gas discharges? Yeah, that one is easy enough. Um, no, we are not currently processing any new applications for oil and gas discharges uh, for produced water. All right, thank you, Mike. Let me make sure I'm getting the right to next question. Okay, let's uh, go with this one. I think who uh, guess it might be for Rebecca, but um, how are storm waters per permitted from rock quarries and sand mines and other construction projects that go on for years? that might not be completed for 40 years. Uh, I don't know if that made sense, uh, Rebecca, but um, go ahead. It makes sense, but I'm still trying to figure out what we're trying to accomplish with the question. But basically, if uh, quarry is in place and some of them do last for 30 years or longer, they need to maintain their MSGP authorization if they have one or an individual permit, or if they're in the John Graves area, then depending on where they're at, they, they do either an individual or general permit for the appropriate for the John Graves area. But they need to keep that MSGP authorization or, or whatever permit they have um, going. So they have to keep renewing, renew it until the site is finally, because you know, the quarrying activity or the industrial regulated activity is completed and you have final civilization that's been achieved, then that's when you can go ahead and terminate the the permit for that um, site. So I'm not sure if that's what you were trying to get at, but that's what I understand from the question. Is there anything else do you think, Michaela, that we need to add or? No, I think maybe the Maybe the question is focusing more on construction. So if somebody is oh, yeah. operating or they're going to start up a rock quarry or a sand mine, they might obtain a construction permit for kind of the beginnings of it. So they're, you know, setting up the roads into the into the quarry and that kind of thing. And then whenever they're actually performing that industrial activity of, you know, quarrying and mining, that's when they're going to be using an industrial permit, the MSGP or the John Graves or something like that. So that's going to cover them over the life of their industrial activity as long as they maintain it. All right. Thank you, Michaela and Rebecca. And I think, uh, Rebecca, this, Rebecca, this might be one for you. Um, can you please provide an example of a non-exempt activity under the pending MSGP oil and gas amendment that will require a MSGP for oil and gas under the renewal. The example of a non-exempt activity under the pending MSGP. It, well, right now we don't have a pending uh, amendment for the MSGP we have for a construction. So we haven't started the, the work on the amendment to the MSGP. Yeah, go, go ahead, Lori. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, so a non-exempt activity that would need to seek multi-sector general permits, um, 
that could potentially be like a uh, a gas plant. So gas plant storm, stormwater discharges at gas plants uh, are not exempt. So they are required to to get coverage, um, get authorization for discharges of stormwater. They can either do so um, under our MSGP once it is renewed to or not a renewed. I'm sorry. Once it's amended to allow oil and gas discharges, um, or they could alternatively get coverage through an individual permit. Most of the gas plants um, have process generated wastewater, so they would typically get an individual permit for that wastewater. And if they do already have an individual permit for their wastewater, they could also get the stormwater covered under that individual permit. So that's an example of an industrial activity that generates oil and gas stormwater that's non-exempt. And I, just one more thing I'll add to that. So I, Rebecca mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again. Um, sorry, we're jumping back and forth with the camera, but that's okay. I'll just keep going. Um, right now, our MSGP and our CGP do not authorize oil and gas activities. Um, if you need coverage right now under either one of those uh, general permits, you would seek authorization from EPA. So EPA has general permits for construction general for construction and industrial activities um, that you can seek coverage under. If it's under the Texas portion of their permits. So if you need stormwater coverage in an oil and gas site, apply under EPA's existing general permit until we get our general permit amended to include oil and gas. So with that, I will turn it back over to Greg. All right, thank uh, you, Lori. Can I can I add something? <laughs> oh, go ahead, uh, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, and and just oh, yeah, okay. And just to let you know, we will include the SIC codes in the MSGP because, of course, you know the MSGP is driven by SIC codes and industrial activity. We will include the SIC codes that are going to be now affected by the oil and gas delegation. So that would be that would help when when you do see that general permit. Great, thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, not seeing any other questions in our in our chat box, I'll uh, go ahead and mention a couple of announcements uh, for upcoming meetings on our calendar. Of course, this uh, very uh, advisory work group meeting that we're in will have the next uh, edition of the of the meeting on Tuesday, July twentieth of this year, twenty twenty one. Same time at 1.30 p.m. So uh, as usual, we'll start to send out some information about that uh, meeting and the and its agenda as we get closer to that date. So again, that's Tuesday, July 20th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. for the next Water Quality Advisory Work Group meeting. And also there'll be a, another House Bill 2771 stakeholder meeting that's going to be on Thursday, June 17th, 2021 of this year at 1.30 p.m. And uh, if you would like to be added as uh, on, the, on the stakeholder list for the future meetings and correspondence for these meet, uh, House Bill 2771 meetings, uh, you can email your request to HB2771 at tcq.texas.gov. So that's HB2771 at tcq dot texas dot gov and um actually I, that was all the announcements i had but i did see one more question uh pop in so we'll try to address that and sounds like it's a continuation on what rebecca you were saying about the uh, sic codes um so it says so overall the the oil and gas activity that TCQ is referring to is referring to mainly midstream and not upstream oil and gas activity based on SIC codes. I don't know Rebecca if you know the answer to that or not, but if not, maybe someone else might. Um, I'll I'll take a little stab at it. So basically, um, yes, it's at my SIC codes and it is 
we're still not going to be um, regulating the exploration of uh, oil and gas or extraction. That is still something that is not, that's a, an, ex, an exempt activity that cannot be regulated. So um, I'm, I'm trying to read, so it's, um, yeah, it's the drilling and movement and placement of drilling equipment, waste management pits and the field treatment plants and infill transportation infrastructure. Um, all those are right now included in the exemption. So I don't know if you want to add something to this, Laurie. I'm good. All right, thank you very much. OK, well, I believe uh, that all the questions we've got. Uh, so thank you to everyone uh, out there for watching and for participating in our, our work group meeting. We uh, do appreciate your participation and uh, look forward to doing this again in, in three months. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and adjourn our meeting, bring it to a close here. And uh, thanks again for your for being with us. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Y'all take care.